Coco. Good morning, everyone. I'm Assembly Member Linda B. Rosenthal. I'm the chair of the Committee on Social Services and the former chair of the Committee on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, and I represent the 67th Assembly District, which includes the Upper West Side, parts of Hell's Kitchen, and John Jay College. I'd like to welcome everyone to my district and thank John Jay President Carol Mason and the entire John Jay community for their hospitality and hard work. John Jay has a deep connection to the often overlapping issues of addiction and incarceration. And it has an excellent addiction studies program. It operates the innovative prison to college pipeline and has done cutting edge research into these issues and its contribution, contributions to this space have been invaluable. Over the years, Governor Hochul has spent a fair amount of time in my district, as she has in all of our districts. And, and I'm grateful to her for bringing us together to sign this five bill harm reduction and overdose prevention package in the law. Many of us in this room thought this day would never come, which makes it all the more meaningful. I'm proud to say that I was the sponsor of two bills in this package, uh, legislation I carry with Senator Harcum to create a publicly searchable database to help New Yorkers easily find naloxone in their communities. Uh, when administered quickly, naloxone can reverse an overdose and save a life. This bill combined with other legislation from Assemblymember Dinowitz would go a long way to destigmatize and encourage naloxone's widespread use across the state. I'm also the sponsor of A533 with Senator Jamal Bailey, which will finally, finally require state prisons and local jails to provide incarcerated individuals with access to medicated assisted treatment. <laughs> MAT is the gold standard in addiction treatment. Substance use disorder affects more than 80% of incarcerated people, yet only 20% of state facilities and less than half of all local jails provide MAT. Overdose rates among informally incarcerated individuals are sky high, and people who have been released from incarceration are more than 40 times more likely to die of an opioid overdose than the average person. By providing access to MAT to people who are incarcerated along with counseling and a plan for a smooth re-entry into society, we will save lives. We will reduce recidivism. And along the way, we will probably make prisons and jails safer for all involved. Finally, correction facilities will have to treat addiction like any other health condition and provide medication instead of punishment. Struggling with addiction is not a criminal act, nor is it a moral failing. And providing sick people with health care should not be considered revolutionary. We have lost so many people to overdose in 2020 as the COVID-19 pandemic ravaged us, a more silent epidemic that many of us in this room were yelling about, the overdose epidemic raged, raged on in New York State, and we lost a record number of people to preventable overdose in 2020. That is not an acceptable outcome. For too long, society fought a failed war on drugs where sick people struggling with addiction were locked up 
instead of provided with treatment. This was and continues to be true for people of color who are incarcerated at disproportionately high rates. And while we have made tremendous strides in our approaches to addiction treatment, too many people still believe that jail is where people struggling with addiction belong. We've got a long way today to go, but today with governor's signature on this important package of bills, New York recognizes its failures and charts a better path forward. The causes of addiction, crisis, and overdose epidemic are myriad and complex, but the solution is simple. We must treat substance use disorder like any other public health crisis. We must mobilize a public health response that is designed to meet and treat people where they are, even if they are in prison or jail. And we must adequately fund supportive programs and the organizations that deliver them. I want to thank Governor Kathy Hochul for recognizing the importance of these bills and moving quickly in the early days of her governorship to sign them into law. I've, I've served with Governor Hochul on a task force. I know she is deeply invested, deeply educated in all of these issues, and she understands the pain and loss that too often accompanies addiction. It is a loss that many New Yorkers and their families have endured. It is my hope and the hope of so many others that the signing of these bills into law signals a significant shift in the way that New York handles addiction issues. We have an opportunity to recognize the humanity of people who struggle with addiction and provide them with the life-saving support that they need. I have many other bills for you to sign. <laughs> including the bill to authorize OPCs, but that's for another day. But I, I am truly grateful, and I know everyone in this room is truly, truly grateful that you have helped us step out of the dark ages. Yes. <laughs> and brought, brought us to a place where we can meet, we can discuss, and the stigma doesn't exist in this room, and you have been a major champion of moving us in that direction. So I personally thank you, and everyone else here thanks you, and I'm honored to be here with you. One last item, I just have to announce the people who are here, um, our great Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Uh, State Senator Brad Hoylman, <laughs> Assemblymember Dick Gottfried, uh, State Senator Jamal Bailey, State Senator Pete Harcum, uh, State Senator Jim Sanders, but I'm not sure if he's arrived yet, uh, State Senator Gustavo Rivera. <laughs> and Assembly Member Jeffrey Dinowitz. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Governor Kathy Hochul. Good morning and thank you for the warm welcome. It is so great to be back here at John Jay uh, I just want to thank our president for always making us feel so welcome here. We've done many events. We will continue to do events because uh, the simple presence of being here signals our commitment to people who find themselves trapped in the criminal justice system. And we come here and we talk about policies and ideas and inspiring the next generation of leaders who will carry on the values that we treasure here as New Yorkers. So thank you so much for, for hosting us, giving this opportunity uh, to be here today. Uh, I am joined by 
the dream team, uh, the individuals that'll be joining me here today are the ones who are toiling out there. They're the ones who are listening to their constituents, they're the ones meeting with the advocates, they're the ones having the hearings in Albany, they're the ones penning the legislation late at night and getting it over the finish line. And I believe that they deserve the credit. I am here to sign because this is a statement of, of my priorities, but also I wanna give uh, equal credit to all of our legislators. Let's give them another round of applause. Uh, Dick Godfrey, Senator Jamal Bailey, Senator Pete Harcum, Senator Gustavo Rivera, Senator uh, Assembly Member Jeff Patinowitz, and uh, our home senator here, Senator Brad Hoylman, and my great friend Gail Brewer, who I see every day of the week, it seems. Okay, uh, but that's always a pleasure. That's always a pleasure. Uh, this is personal to me. It was about six years ago when we lost my beloved nephew to addiction. And he started out like many other families experience. He did not set out to be a teenage addict. That was not his goal in life. He was a young athlete, he was outgoing, he was the joy at our family gatherings. Uh, Michael was just had this zest for life. And he worked hard, his family didn't have a lot of money. He worked at a delicatessen, like I did. I worked at a deli, I worked at a pizzeria. And I happen to know that there's some very sharp equipment there. I actually have some scars from when I got burned on a pizzeria. But he, he cut his hand deeply on a piece of equipment at the delicatessen. Goes to the doctor to heal him, to heal him. And he follows the doctor's directions. The doctor prescribes a teenager a supply of opiate-based prescription drugs to alleviate the pain. The pain continues, another prescription, continues, the next thing we know, he's developed an addiction, and he finds that it's cheaper to acquire the drug that makes him feel better, as his brain chemistry has now changed because it begins to change literally after a matter of days and weeks where the addiction forms and he starts going to the streets. Streets are cheaper, easier, hides it from his mom for as long as he can, gets into trouble, ends up in jail. His mom has to be strip searched to go visit him in jail in our community. The indignity inflicted on our family for people who still loved Michael but saw that he would become a different person. We never gave up hope in Michael. Michael had to do his time. He came out. We thought we had a facility to put him in. The Medicaid papers were not in order and they sent him home. So he didn't get the home that he thought he was gonna be spending the next few months in, in recovery when he was ready to do it. And he went back and all started all over again. The addiction, trouble, streets, homeless shelter. And we actually thought he was starting to turn the corner again because it takes a long time, my friends. It's not, it's not once, twice, it could be a hundred times. But ultimately people do persevere. Michael didn't live in all, long enough because what he thought he could handle had been laced with a new form of fentanyl, which was this d deadly concoction where he thought he could handle it to deal with some stress of the day despite the fact that he was back in school and he'd actually become a coach for other people in addiction. He started on that path and the fentanyl took him down. His mother found him with the needles in his arms and we buried him a few days later after a wake that drew probably 500 people. I had no idea of the people he had already been touching to give them hope, to give them inspiration, and how devastated they were when they saw that someone who believed in their, them and their recovery did not survive themselves. That's why this is personal for me. I don't want other families to endure this. I want people, all the Michaels out there who are struggling, who fell into this place that no child ever expects to be in, no parents expects their child to fall in, no one expects their brothers or sisters, but life happens, my friends. There's no reason to point fingers or to blame or to find a cause. We just deal with what we're dealing with right here and right now. And when the state of New York has the ability to take steps that can just minimize the stress that people are going through, to make it easier on them and their families, to let them know that there should not be stigma associated with seeking medication-assisted treatment or any other variation that you need to get yourself in order. We have to send the message, we are there with you. You are still 
an important part of my family, our family, the New York family. And that is the message that has to be shouted out across this state, that there are good people with great potential and they're just dealing with an illness right now. And how do we deal with that illness? That's what I thank our legislators for doing, putting together smart people. I know there was a gathering here about five years ago and you talked about what happened in prisons and talking about how people, while they're doing their debt to society for whatever they did, they also can be on a treatment plan so when they come back out, they can start talking about a job, an opportunity, and they may, can come out even more healed than them when they went in. Why wouldn't we take advantage of that opportunity to invest in people, give them simple, something as simple as medication to help them deal with their illness while they're incarcerated, just like we would make sure that they have their diabetes drugs or their cancer drugs or something else to deal with whatever their ailment may be. That's how you destigmatize it, but you also just say, and we're gonna help you heal because we want you back in society. I want fewer people in prisons. I don't want you going out, stealing again like Michael did and ending right back in there. I can stop that cycle if we're smart enough that while we have the captive audience, so to speak, uh, that we can help you heal and then we won't see you again. We'll see you at the job fair, then we'll see you at your job, we'll see you in the grocery store and life returns to normal. That's the path we're on with the bills we're signing today. And I'm proud of them. And I want to thank again the leaders and all the advocates. And I want to thank people like Cassandra. Uh, thank you for dedicating your life and representing so many other groups out there, the executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance. Uh, this alliance is powerful. Uh, your voices are heard. I hope you know that. And that is why we're here today. You made sure we listened. Your elected officials responded. And that's what brought us here today. So this is not a celebration of what a governor does today. It's what this community asks for and receives when you have people who actually do more listening and say, yes, I understand what you're going through and I understand that there's hope behind these bills. I will briefly uh, talk about what exactly they are. I know you know what they are. And uh, Assembly Member Rosenthal did a beautiful job describing the situation. I don't need to go back through that, but I think everyone knows, I know everyone knows that we had a crisis before with respect to the addiction and opiate substance abuse and uh, the number of people succumbing to this. After COVID, it is a crisis on steroids. Uh, it has gotten so much worse because people found themselves so discombobulated, so taken out of their normal world and their support systems, whether it was in school or their job or the family, and they couldn't get to their, their recovery coaches, they couldn't get the medication. So many people fell through the cracks, no fault of their own because of this pandemic. So now the problem that we were already dealing with has just gotten so much worse. And we lost over 5,100 New Yorkers from a preventable overdose last year alone. 5,100 families that just are saying, how did that happen? How did that happen? Uh, overdoses continue to kill more New Yorkers than car accidents, suicides, and homicides combined. That is a problem that can no longer be swept under the rug. That is real. It's affecting not just families. It affects our economy. It affects productivity at work. There's a ripple effect to this crisis. And that's why as much as we mourn each individual and will continue to do so, we also want to th talk about their families for one minute and thank the families that have sometimes turn their grief into helping others. And that's exactly what my sister and my niece did for her brother. They became trained recovery coaches. And so to them, I extend my eternal gratitude and let them know we're gonna continue signing bills and we'll continue making policies to help lift them out of uh, the abyss that many of them find themselves in. So we are signing five comprehensive and forward-thinking overdose prevention bills. And what we're trying to do is just remove barriers to treatment. It's really simple. It's really simple, barriers to treatment. And first of all, I also approach this job as just, just some common sense things to do, aren't there not? I mean, you've been talking about this for seven years, some of these five years where I'm really impatient. As you get to know me as your governor, I'm like, okay, why didn't we do this yesterday? That's how I roll, that's my family. Uh, and so you think about the fact that right now, right, <laughs> think about the illogic nature, Ill, Ill, un, Ill, illogical nature of this. I mean, let me tell you this. Right now, 
Syringes are illegal in the state of New York. There are some police officers locking people up for possession of a syringe, right? Okay. The jails are, jails are full enough. I think we don't need people there for syringes possession. On the other hand, the state of New York gives out millions of syringes to help people because of the public health crisis. So, okay, you're going to jail, but it's okay for the state of New York to do this. Does anybody think that should continue to be the law in the state of New York? Okay, all right, that's why we're here. Let's just, uh, Gustavo Rivera recognized that, and Richard Godfrey from the Assembly, they recognized this. They said, can we just fix this? And today we are, we are gonna uh, decriminalize the possession of a syringe in the state of New York. <laughs> And another issue, when I was uh, co-chair of the Heroin Opioid Task Force that took me to every corner of the state over the last seven years, we had many hearings, we talked to people, I went to visit jails, I talked to sheriffs, I said, what's the problem like in your jails? Well, we don't have the resources, there's not, you know, we don't really want to do this, and just everybody had a different philosophy about what happens to people in Carson, and I spoke about this earlier. Uh, luckily, we have Senator Jamal Bailey and Assembly Member Linda Rosenthal who said, Let's fix this. Why aren't we helping people while they're in jail? So our second bill that we're signing and is going to make tremendous sense, but it's also going to make a difference in people's lives in that we are now mandating medication-based assistance treatment in all New York State jails and prisons. And that will now be available to anyone in prison who needs it. And Senator Pete Harcum and Assemblymember Rosenthal also said, why don't we have an online directory so people can find out where to get the opioid antagonists or reversal drugs. And I can't tell you how many first responders have I've spoken to who said they have saved thousands of lives because they had naloxone with them or another opioid overdose reversal drug with them. And so why isn't that widely available? There are parts of our state where people just don't know how to get this. How simple is it for the state of New York to have an online directory, tell you where to get it, make it available over the counter, which was one of the recommendations that um, our task force came up with a few years ago, and let's get it done. Let's just make it more accessible to New Yorkers so we can save lives and then get people into recovery. Let's get that done as well. That's the third bill we'll be signing as well. Uh, Senator Sanders, I don't know if Senator Sanders had a chance to arrive yet. If you are, here's a clap for him. Uh, uh, and. Uh, Assembly Member Dinowitz also, they also said, uh, why, <laughs> this is another one of those logic ones, friends. I mean, this, this is so much, so easier sometimes to just see what's going on here. We're trying to encourage people to use opiate reversal drugs, right? They can stay, or opiate reversal treatment drugs. We can do this. We want to encourage it. But yet, it, right now in the state of New York, that can be used as evidence of a crime against you. Do you think that's a disincentive to use it, my friends? It, it sure is. Does it make sense? No, it's gone. We're getting rid of that today as well. So naloxone and other life-saving drugs will not be no longer used as evidence in court that if a crime has been committed. Uh, also, Senator Bailey and Assemblymember Richardson have our last bill, which expands the number of eligible crimes for a person to be diverted for substance abuse treatment. Yes, why don't we help people get them through this, stop locking them up if their crime does not justify it, and we can make sure that we can start turning their lives around, and then you start turning a community around, a neighborhood around, and we start turning the state around because we're believing in people and not treating people who are suffering from an illness like, as the assembly member said, like they're criminals. That is the change that we're making here today by signing these well thought out bills, and I'm gonna give you one more message. We're not finished yet, my friends. These are five bills, they're profound, they're gonna make a difference, but I'm gonna to continue to listen, as I have for many, many years, to all of the advocates. Uh, I've spoken at more uh, conferences and forums and uh, small gatherings and launched more initiatives, whether it's mobile vans or uh, programs in schools. I've done it all, but I also know there's more to be done, and I'm gonna to listen to your ideas, uh, way, new ways that we can make sure that we're using the latest uh, available medication, what works, what doesn't work. We're going to make sure that New York State leads the nation in terms of how we deal with this crisis because our people are suffering, they need us, and the people in this room are going to help us get that done. So thank you very much, everyone. Please welcome Senator Pete Harcum. Good morning, everyone. 
how do you follow the governor? You know, we're in the back room drawing straws. Who get, let's get Harkham to do it. He's the new guy. I, I, guess, I guess the way you follow the governor is just to say thank you for your leadership and for gathering us here today. Um, you know, when, yes, please, thank you. As, as someone who's been blessed uh, to live in recovery, when I hear Michael's story, or when I get calls from constituents who've lost their children, you know, there before the grace go I, is, is, is what I say, excuse me. Um, and so, so what we want, what all of us want, are, are the things that I had for a successful recovery. And that's access to treatment, it's access to insurance, it's access to medication, it's access to housing, it's access to employment, all those determinants of a successful recovery I had. And that's what we want every New Yorker to have that opportunity. And we thank you, Governor Hochul, for everything you're doing and your leadership. So I, I kind of went off script and, and I <laughs> apologize, um, but I do want to take a moment to thank our, our Senate and Assembly colleagues, uh, including the Assembly partner, uh, Linda Rosenthal. We partnered on a number of bills. Uh, she's a great advocate and partner. Uh, we also want to thank our Majority Leader, um, State Senator Andrea Stewart-Cousins, for her leadership and entrusting me to chair the Committee on Alcoholism and Substance Abuse. Um, I, I take that very seriously, and I, I'm very proud to chair that committee. Um, as we've been saying, the enormity of the opioid crisis requires immediate and timely action, and today is a very important step forward in ending this crisis. And among the important bills you heard was our bill, which will create the online directory so people know where to go. We just had an award ceremony in Mount Pleasant where we honored seven police officers who saved seven lives. Seven people are alive because of naloxone. And that's what this directory will do. We need to get Narcan in the hands of as many people as possible. But the fight is far from over. As the governor said, this is a first step. We must continue to work together to remove the barriers to treatment. We must reduce stigma around substance use disorder and opioid use disorder. And we bring people who are suffering out of the shadows. And we must create a system of integrated care that treats the whole person. And that includes co-occurring disorders and mental health disorders that people are self-medicating. And with the right support and with the resolve of everybody here, the solutions um, are attainable to ending this crisis. And we may still have a way to go but today, we are taking great, great strides in the right direction. So truly, it's time for New York to fight the crisis with all of the resources we have, and that's all of our great advocates, and that's leadership of a great governor, and leadership of great colleagues in the Assembly and the Senate. Thank you so much. Please welcome Senator Jamal Bailey. Good morning, everyone. Um, Senator Harkin mentioned it was difficult to follow the governor, and it is, but it's hard to follow one of the most decent people in state government, one of the best people that you can serve with in Senator Pete Harkin, who leads with his heart in, in chairing his committee. He brings a, a sense of personal experience that many folks may not have, but he lays the cards on the table for what New Yorkers need, and New Yorkers need compassion. We need treatment, not jails. It's not just a slogan. Behind every bill number, there's a person, there's a family. There's a community. Treatment not jail is not just a slogan, it is a way of life. And if we really are about looking to rehabilitate as opposed to incarcerate, then these bills that our great governor is signing today are necessary. Madam Governor, I, I thank you for your leadership, not just in signing these bills, but in your for your commitment. Uh, the Bronx and Buffalo share more than just an alliterative beginning of our, of our place. It's the bees in the Bronx and the, in Buffalo. It's, it's a feeling of a chip on our shoulder. It is being ignored. It is being depressed. It is being down. It is being victims of the opioid crisis, which quite frankly is only a crisis in certain zip codes. Where I was from, 
if we're and, and if we're going to be and if we're going to be speak a moment of truth, where I was from, 10466 uptown, the Bronx, New York, people were called. They weren't called. Um, they weren't called patients. They were called junkies. They were called crackheads. They were called fiends. No longer. We are literally changing, changing the way that we speak about people. They are no longer inmates. They are individuals who are incarcerated. It is no longer drug addiction. It is substance use disorder. Changing the name of these things makes a difference. And as the chair of the codes committee, I uh, understand the link between substance use and incarceration and recidivism and crime. And the best way to do that is to, one, in the bill that I have with the assembly member, um, uh, Diana Richardson, and I thank the assembly for leading for so many years when we couldn't get things done in the Senate until the great Andre Stewart Cousins became the majority leader. Um, but they've been pushing on expanding the number of offenses that allow you to be eligible for, um, for these diversion courts. And that's critically important because there are success stories that we all know in our very own communities. Um, a, a gentleman in, in Mount Vernon who I'll just say by his initials, SP, if you, er, he speaks at a drug court graduation every single year and he can tell you the amount of time that he's been clean if not for those programs being eligible for those offenses. And, uh, and I wanna thank Assemblymember Rosenthal for, for calling me and saying, I, I would like for you to sponsor this bill. And I want to thank the advocates for allowing me the opportunity and believing in me to carry this to the finish line. If not for you and for your understanding that I, that, that I would take this seriously, um, I, I would not have been able to carry it with such strength. And, and, and medication assisted treatment in, in, in facilities. I, I, I don't know how much the outside world, outside of this room, understands how big of a deal that's going to be. Um, when an individual is incarcerated, uh, um, sometimes they begin to lose hope. And they may revert to some of the things and some of the rationale as to why they were incarcerated. While incarcerated is the time to make that whole person, as Senator Harkin said, to help reinvent them, to recreate them, to give, him, give them the rehabilitation that they need and that they deserve. And so expanding this is, is honestly a, a no-brainer, Madam Governor. And thank you for uh, your leadership in the past on, on opioid issues. Thank you for your leadership in, on, on those task force that, that in your prior role going around the state and listening to people and hearing what people had to say. Thank you for understanding that it's not just a zip code by zip code kind of conversation. It's something that affects every single person, whether you have been affected individually by addiction, you have been affected by addiction. Let us be very clear about that. And so, so to close, I just want to say I, I, I'm grateful for your leadership. I'm grateful for my colleagues in government for their leadership. But I'm from a place called the Bronx, New York. And, and we still suffer from some of the highest rates of opioid addiction. And, 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 we, and I've met many of you at, at, at events that were put on by our health chair, chair, Senator Rivera, where you spoke passionately about the need for programs like this. So I, so I would just say, let this be the beginning and not the end of what we do. Let us continue to treat people as people and put people first, as opposed to putting the behind the eight ball. And let us continue to have a more fair and just society. Thank you all. Please welcome Assemblymember Dick Gottfried. Well. <laughs> Well, good morning. Um, if, if I can lighten, this is a pretty heavy event. If I can lighten the tone just for a moment. You know, I've served with nine governors now. Um, I don't think I've seen color-coordinated wristbands before. Uh, but Governor, I have to say, I, I was thinking about this while you were talking. Of the nine governors I've I've heard talk, I don't think I've heard more compelling remarks than what you delivered this morning, and I want to thank you for that. And I also want to thank you for the fact that every day you are making good things happen. So let's give a round of applause for that. You. 
you know, it's now 20 years ago that we thought we had legalized possession of hypodermics in New York. Uh, with the language that I wrote. Um, <laughs> but actually, uh, it surprised the dickens out of me that Governor Pataki made it happen, ultimately. Uh, but that was 20 years ago. And because of the, shall we say, overly aggressive misinterpretation of glitches in that legislation, glitches that remain, uh, every year police officers are sending people to Rikers Island and other jails around the state uh, on the grounds that they're illegally possessing a hypodermic. And that doesn't do any good. All that does is make efforts at harm reduction uh, harder to achieve and sets people back uh, on what ought to be a, a difficult road uh, to recovery uh, and a difficult road in life. And it's long overdue uh, that we correct that. And uh, I want to thank the governor uh, for the fact that one of the bills, uh, Governor, that you're signing today is, uh, is the syringe decriminalization bill. So, thank you. Please welcome Cassandra Frederic. Can you tell I brought my own cheering section? <laughs> So I want to thank the elected officials for your work. And I want to thank uh, Governor Hochul. And I want to thank you in particular, Governor, because our first conversation in our first conversation, we talked about the shared identity we have. Because my family was one of the 5,100 New Yorkers that lost someone this year. New Yorkers didn't ask for this fight. We didn't ask for it. We didn't ask for the divestment in our communities. We didn't ask for the over-incarceration. We didn't ask for the stigma. We did not ask for this fight. Assemblyman Gottfried, you talked about 20 years ago the bill, but that fight started in the 90s. That fight started with brave HIV AIDS activists who knew what they needed was access to sterile equipment. They pushed. And former Mayor Dinkins acquiesced and listened to health folks who said, we need sterile equipment. Five years ago, we had a conference in this very room about medication-assisted treatment in jails and prisons because it was the 30th anniversary of the pilot program at Rikers Island. It is the 35th anniversary of the first incarcerated place giving access to medication. New Yorkers didn't ask for the fight, but we are sure as hell going to finish it. Because New Yorkers understand what is necessary. I'm standing here, but I am not the person that I am not alone. The advocates, we tell y'all what to do because we know what's happening on the ground. And you all are people in the community that we have chosen to do the work. It has been a long time since we've been able to do the work. And I'm grateful for the work that advocates have done in wrestling back democracy into the hands of New Yorkers. I wanna thank and acknowledge the advocates that I'm standing in the place of. Vocal New York, you know you have all of my heart. 
you all taught me about syringe exchange. You taught me why incarceration was not the way to deal with this health issue. Thank you for your consistent, dogged effort in making sure that this goes forward. And thank you for the advocates that are part of our family that are not here, people like Elizabeth Owens and Bobby Tolbert that have been leading this fight for the last decade. I wanna thank the National Action Network, Callan Lord, Compa, Allegra, consistently pushing, pushing and pushing and pushing. NICLU, Reach Medical in Ithaca. It's important for people to know that one of the other places that did syringes first was in Buffalo. So this is not a downstate only issue. Upstate has been giving them the business for a very long time. Legal Aid, Legal, Legal Action Center, Tracy Gardner. We got the pictures that show that you've been there from the beginning. Harlem United, New Pride Agenda, GMHC, the Greater Harlem Coalition, Housing Works, Charles. And I wanna thank the family that we created the End Overdose Coalition, because when people try to con make the disconnection between upstate and downstate advocates, white versus black versus Latino versus indigenous, queer folks, when they said we could not come together, we said we could. And we have created the baddest statewide coalition to be clear that our pain is shared and some of us have to speak first. And so I wanna thank everyone again. I know I went over my minute, but I wanna say that I'm here because y'all pushed. I'm only here because y'all taught. And it's really important. We know we have a lot more work to do. Yeah. It seems like we have way better partners on the other side. Mm -hmm. But let's make sure we don't let them get too comfortable. Right. Make some noise, y'all. Right. I never get comfortable. Uh, thank you for the depth of passion that you bring to this, Cassandra, the people that you've inspired. Your words are so powerful. Um, this is truly one of the humbling parts of being your governor is to be able to come into a room like this and hear just how people's hearts have guided them to do the right thing, whether they're the elected officials are the advocates who have other lives to lead, but they dedicate their talents to helping save others. Humbling, powerful, and it's so New York. Thank you, and let's sign some bills. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay seated while the bills are being signed. <laughs> yeah, I've done this a lot since I've been in. I have and you have so many more to go. I know, Linda, I got 400 <laughs> more to go. I know, I'm trying to get... Monthly average, that's a lot of pens. <laughs> that's why you can't work. Yeah. Can I do one with Monday? Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, I get right to the last letter. <laughs> there we go. Let alone have to all over again. Let me present this to you, Sadat. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Father Gabriel. Thank you. Thank You're you. a good fighter. All right. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for all you do. Amazing. Oh. Oh. Neighbor. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I'm a co-sponsor. Is anybody we miss? Do we want to pose then? Let's just hold up the picture.
little flavor. It's a little quieter than it was my last one, so I thought I would do that so you could get the best audio and be able to hear everything I say. Appreciate you coming out. As you know, that there was a very emotional event we just held. A lot of people uh, thinking about the long, long journey they had to be on in order to get to the state to have what I believe are common sense measures to help us deal with harm reduction and getting people out of the throes of addiction. So I feel proud of what we've, I am proud of what we've done. Uh, again, proud of our legislators for their, them being such great partners uh, as we continue to do whatever we can to help people who are suffering from uh, substance abuse addiction. So uh, any, any on topic questions? Today's day 45, you had said that you'd be making some changes from holdovers from the Cuomo administration. I wonder if you could just speak generally about that. I'm not asking for a list, but of most of those who have left already moved on. And I did want to ask you specifically about Rick Cotton at the Port Authority, who has been actively campaigning for the air train, which is against your wishes, my understanding. You wanted it reevaluated. Um, is that inconsistent? Is that going to be a problem? No. I was with Rick last night as we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Port Authority. It was a beautiful event. And uh, when I asked Rick to stay on because I want his vast experience and his knowledge of the major projects, many of which I will continue to support, but he also said he will defer to my wishes in terms of any area where I want to take a second look and to evaluate. So that's the point we are. Uh, we are working closely together, and I thanked him for continuing to lead us heading into the next 100 years. And the first part of your question, you're absolutely right. We, we made changes from day one. I didn't say they're all going to happen on day 45. I held out as that is a time when you've already seen major changes in the second floor. It is unrecognizable to people who are used to seeing the individuals who are there in the past. That's what I promised. The second floor, my executive team would change. The caliber of people that we've been able to attract is extraordinary. Uh, people like Karen Keogh and and Catherine Garcia, and I have a brand new health commissioner starting to Mary Bassett, who I was just thanked again by our legislators from the city saying, it's amazing you have her uh, leaving her position at Harvard to come serve in your administration. And there are others I've asked to stay who had been uh, involved in projects I'm working on a long time, but I, my position was anybody who was named in that report uh, by the attorney general would no longer be part of my my cabinet, my, my second floor administration. As you will note, uh, there are individuals who are on boards that have longer terms. I've asked people to resign, but I cannot really replace people. I've accepted resignation. I can't replace them until the Senate's back. And so you'll see another time frame when there's a shift. But I'm really proud of the individuals I have who are working in the trenches with me all day long, late at night. And uh, they're an incredible team, and you all get to know them much better. Yes. What came out this morning with Larry Schwartz and his uh, announcement he will be resigning once he's replaced probably in January. Can you say if that was you who asked him to resign, can you clarify why? If you, if well, I, he, he offered to resign. He, he offered from the very beginning that if I wanted to bring in a new team, and we've been focused on cabinet positions and other positions, uh, I'm shifting my attention to board positions now. So, so I, I thank him for his service. He continues to be a voice of someone who knows the positions of New York State. This is a a by state commission, so to speak, authority. There are representatives from New Jersey and New York, and I want to make sure that New York continues to be represented until such time as I can um, make new appointments with the confirmation of the Senate, which will not be till January. That'll all work out very smoothly. Governor, so what I've heard today it seems like you want to help people who are already addicted, which is a good thing, obviously, but two quick questions. Is there any plan to make sure people don't get addicted in the first place? And secondly, the fentanyl, which is coming mostly from China over Mexico into the U.S. to New York. Is there any plan to keep that out of New York as well? Yeah. Uh, this is an issue, and the fentanyl, is, as I mentioned,